So a young boy went to the local store with his mom, and uh, as they entered the store, the the store owner, a very kind older gentleman, passed uh, a large jar of candy and invited the little boy to help himself to a handful of candy. Uh, Shockingly, the boy held back, and so the shop owner pulled out a handful for him. When they got outside, the mom, who was very surprised, asked why he had suddenly been so shy and wouldn't take a handful of the candy that was being offered to, offered to which the boy replied, because, mommy, his hand is much bigger than mine. Okay. I thought it was cuter than you did. <laughs> The reason why I start with that story is so many times in our lives, um, we don't realize that God has so much more to offer us than anything this world has to offer. I don't know about you, and I I know this to be true. I, I, I know that the world has nothing to offer, but how many times do I still, still seek after the things of this world? And forget that his blessings are so much greater than anything that this world could offer. I want to talk tonight about a subject that I think most people love to talk about, and that's the blessed life. How many, just a, a quick survey, how many, how many like to, would like to live a blessed life? Just raise your hand if you'd like to live the blessed life, you'd like to experience the blessings of God. Of course, right? I mean, who would not want to experience a blessed life? And uh, I think that's great. In fact, it's biblical. I think when you study scripture from beginning to end, you, you, you discover that uh, God does want to bless people. He wants to bless our lives. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be blessed. Um, But tonight, as we continue through 1 Peter and look at chapter 3 and the second half, or really the middle section of chapter 3 of 1 Peter, uh, I want to challenge us. What exactly does that mean, though, the blessed life? I, I know what's taught, I, I know, uh, you know what people are saying, I know sometimes even the songs that are being sung, the books that are being written about the blessings of God, and, and I want to just throw out there something that, that maybe in some ways in Christianity in America, in some ways I think that maybe we've misunderstood what the blessing of God is all about. Now let me just again say, I am a big fan of the blessings of God. But I think that there's some faulty teaching out there. I I think there's some teaching out there, and I I think what maybe part of it is, I think sometimes we look at the Old Testament and and we look at the promise of the blessings to the nation of Israel, and we kind of equate that to the same type of blessing uh, that we think that we should reserve as individuals, as New Covenant Christians. And I, I think there's a little bit of a distinction there, and we have to be very careful there. Uh, God certainly wanted to bless a nation, and that nation uh, was to be a a light in the darkness and and show what God can do um, through his people, and certainly uh, there's some lessons that we can learn there, but but here's what I'm getting at. Uh, I think there's teaching that's out there today that, that equates the blessing of God with an abundance of possessions, that the blessings of God means a life that is free of pain and persecution, that, that if we just have enough faith, it's kind of the health and wealth gospel that's so prevalent today that as long as you have faith, the result of that is wealth and health. You'll be able to overcome any sickness in your life. Uh, You'll be able to gain uh, material blessings as a result of that. And and let me just be really clear on something. I think that sometimes God does choose to bless people in monetary ways. Uh, God certainly uh, can choose to to bless a Christian couple's business. But I think it's also equally true that God may choose to have something else happen. (laughs) That sickness and pain and and persecution and trials and things not working out can still be part of the blessing of God. 
Now that doesn't sell as well as health and wealth guarantees, but it's more biblical. In fact, let me go so far as to say, if, if we're defining the blessed life like, like, like some churches are doing and, and some forms of Christianity in our world today, if we're defining it as the way that I just described, then Jesus Christ himself wasn't very blessed. Because Jesus experienced pain. Jesus experienced sorrow. Jesus in his human form, didn't have much money. They lived off the donations, the ministry of others. His occupation before the last three years of giving himself fully on his way to the cross, he was essentially a handyman. And so I want to talk about the blessed life tonight, but I want to make sure that we're talking about what it means biblically, (laughs) a blessed life. Uh, One of the words that's most often used in the New Testament, which is written in the Greek language for blessed, carries with it the idea of being fortunate. The word can mean enlarged, and, and in particular, carries the idea of favor. So when we're talking about God's blessing, that isn't necessarily equated to financial fortune or not experiencing any sicknesses in our lives. Let me just, let me, let me balance this. I, I do believe faith in God. I think God responds to prayers of faith, okay? I want to make, throw that out there too. But I think that the blessing of God is so much bigger than an abundance of possessions or being free of pain and persecution. The blessing of God is essentially when God chooses to show his favor on us. When he looks upon us and he shows his favor, but here's the thing, that favor (laughs) might look radically different (laughs) for this person over here than it does to that person over there. Ultimately, the blessing of God is when his favor shines on us because he's pleased with us because we are walking closely with him. And we have this sense, because it can also carry the idea of happiness, we have this sense of joy that will, Life is good because I'm experiencing the pleasure of God in my life. Does that make sense? That's my understanding of what it means to be blessed. If God chooses to bless me with financial abundance, he's more than happy to do that. I've got six kids and I'm in the ministry, so he hasn't chosen to yet, okay? But he's more than welcome to, but that, that is not ultimately what it means to truly be blessed. All that said, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. We're looking at the blessed life. We're going to look at four things here tonight as we continue our journey through 1 Peter. We're in chapter 3 looking at verse uh, 8 through 17. I'm still a little bothered you didn't like my opening introduction. I really thought that was cute, uh, but uh, I'm I'm, I'm trying to get over that. Um, But uh, if you haven't, if you weren't here, uh, and this is your first time here and you you haven't a chance to see the, uh, the watch the videos online. Um, Peter is ro- wa- uh, writing this. Excuse me. Peter is writing this to uh, these Christians who are living in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, and he's writing to an, uh, a number of different provinces where they are following after Christ. But by so much of our standards of blessings today. They wouldn't seem to be very blessed. These Christians, because of their commitment to Christ, were losing their jobs. They were losing, you know, um, uh, they were facing persecution. Um, This was the time when Nero was rising up. And this is really within years of Jerusalem uh, being destroyed. Um, And this is within, I think, three years of Peter himself Uh, being killed for his faith. And so this is a time where the Christians sure didn't feel very blessed in the sense of of being, in in their minds, rewarded 
for their commitments to Christ. And so a big part of Peter writing this letter is to remind them, one, that our ultimate blessing isn't here. Uh, It's to come. It's in heaven. But the blessings may look different than you might think. And so that's part of him writing this. He uses the word elect exiles a number of times, reminding them we're not home yet. Don't put all your eggs in this basket here on earth. I really think what's behind some of this misunderstanding of the blessings is because we put so much of our eggs into the basket of this world. And so Peter is trying to remind them, you can live a joy-filled now, life now. You, you can experience the blessings of God no matter your circumstances, and by the way, your heavenly home where you are going to be just bathed in blessings for eternity, nobody will be able to snatch that from you. So I hope that tonight is a source of encouragement as we really dive in, what does that really mean to experience the blessed life? We all want a blessed life, but what does that really look like? All right, let's get started. Verse eight and nine. Peter says, finally, all of you. Now, finally, you you, you kind of think, oh, he's concluding the letter. No, he's only halfway through the letter. Finally, he's concluding his thought that he started with in uh, really actually the the second half of chapter two into chapter three, which is really him going on a section and talking about, and one of the themes of this book is how to be holy in unholy times, is how are we holy in our relationships? Uh, And specifically, um, in its context, our earthly relationships. Uh, uh, How are we living holy? And so finally, he's kind of concluding how we are to behave in our relationships in that particular section. He says this, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Uh, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Let's stop there. The first of four things that I want to mention tonight about the blessed life is number one, we have been blessed to bless, which leads to more blessings. I mean, this is good stuff. This should get you very excited, okay? I mean, the sun coming out today should get you excited. This should get you super excited, all right? Peter is telling us, if you're in Christ, that that you have been blessed so that you can bless, and in blessing, you receive more blessings. It's It's a blessed fest, if you know Christ. When you get it, when you get it, that you've been blessed, not to say, oh, I've been so blessed, look at me, I'm blessed, me, 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 bless, bless, bless. No, when you realize we've been blessed to bless. And he mentions one of the ways to be a blessing, verse 8, is is how we behave with others, that we have a unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. How we treat other people is, is, is really an indication if we get what it means to truly want to be a blessing to the people we work with, to the people we live with. We have been blessed to bless, which means more blessings. I'm going to attempt another illustration. I hope that it goes better. Uh, The story's told of an ancient king who uh, was beloved in his kingdom, and one day a poor carrot farmer showed showed up in his court, and he just wanted to express to the king how much he loved and respected this this benevolent king. And so he shows up, he's a carrot farmer, he shows up with the nicest carrot that he has in his farm, and he presents it before the king, and and he says, oh king, you are such a good and, 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 and great king. I love you so much. I respect you so much. And I want to give this as a thank you for all that you've, you've done uh, for this kingdom. And, and the king was genuinely touched by the sacrifice. This was a poor care farmer. And he gave him the best that he had. And, and he said, you know, I, I, where you live, I, I'm so touched by this that, that I want to actually give you land that I own near you. And so he bestowed upon this poor carrot farmer uh, some, of the, some land that he had owned, and it quadrupled the land that this carrot, uh, carrot farmer had owned before. And, 
And one of the noblemen who was in the court was, was hearing this and watching this go on. And so he said, oh my goodness, if that's what the king will do for just giving a, a, a carrot, imagine what the king would do for me if I bring him the nicest horse in the land. And so the nobleman goes out and he finds the, 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 the most amazing stallion in all of the land and he pays a, a quite a bit of money, but this is the best of the best. And so the next day he comes and he, and he presents this stallion to the king. He says, oh, king, you are so wonderful. You are so great. I am just moved by how amazing you are. And I just wanted to show how much I appreciate all you've done. And, and so I've brought you as a gift this stallion and the king understood what was going on he understood he got the motive of the nobleman's heart and he simply said thank you I appreciate that thank you you're dismissed <laughs> and the nobleman leaves dejected and upset and as he's about ready to walk out the door the king says to him he says listen you need to understand something yesterday the carrot farmer gave the carrot for me Today, you have given the horse for yourself. The reason why I tell you this story is because I think there is a temptation when we think about the blessing of God that sometimes I think it, the temptation, and I'll be the first to admit I've been guilty of this, <laughs> that we bless somebody else <laughs> We do something, whether it's an act of service, uh, you know, or whether it's a monetary, monetary gift of money or what, whatever, but in the back of our minds, we're doing that because we think God will bless us if we bless them. And this is where we have to be very careful because the theological truth of this passage is, is that God blesses those who bless others. When you are overwhelmed by the blessings of God and that leads you to be a blessing to others, that God blesses that. Now, what circumvents that, though, is when the motives of the heart aren't pure. When we're actually giving for us instead of giving because we're overwhelmed by the grace and love and mercy and forgiveness and the holiness and the justice and the righteousness and just the goodness of God. When we're overwhelmed by that, when we're moved by that, when we realize that we don't even deserve breath today, but time and time again, he forgives us and doesn't give up on us, that it leads to a good and gracious heart that says, I just want to bless others because God has blessed me in so many ways. Then we get it. And when we're moved by the blessings of God and it causes us to be a blessing to others, God will heap on more blessings. But the key there is the heart. One of the reasons I know that is because I've read through the Gospels and I've seen <laughs> how Jesus responded to the Pharisees who gave more money than anyone else, who served more than anyone else, but didn't receive the blessings of God because their hearts were far from God. We don't get blessed from God simply because we did some act that blessed others. We're blessed by God when we are moved inwardly in the inner man, in the inner woman, when we are so moved by the blessings of God that we just want to be a blessing to others. When our hearts are right, our motives are pure, that is a life that God blesses. Others may not see the heart. God always does. And when it's genuine and we bless because we've been blessed, it leads to more blessing. Let's look at the second thing. This is really how we can be a blessing. Uh, obviously, um, using our gifts, right? Like the Clevelands use their gifts to bless us. We, we don't pay any of our worship leaders, all right? We, we, all right? we don't pay any of them to come and join us. They come and they, they practice ahead of time. They come, they lead worship because they simply want to be a blessing, Right? So we use our gifts, uh, we use uh, our finances, that's why we give the first fruits that we have uh, to the Lord to bless um, kingdom work, right? But, but, but Peter gives a couple other ways that we can bless. Look at verse 10 and 11. 
for whoever desires to love life and see good days. So, so he doesn't use the word blessing, but isn't that a description of the blessed life? Right? So he's just describing really the blessed life, right? If you desire to love life and see good days. How, how, many, how, how many would like to love life and see good days? Right? Of, of course. Right? There's a few of you who don't have your hands up. Right? No, I want hateful life and horrible days. No, of course. Of course. Who doesn't want that? I want a life that I love. I know that this isn't home, but I still want to love my life. I still want to have good days. Right? That's, the blessed, that's a blessed life. He says, whoever wants that, whoever desires that, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Now, he really describes two things that are important for us to pursue in our lives. One is to pursue a purity with our mouth and a purity with our life, our actions. And so I'm going to word it this way to kind of keep it in the context of, of looking at a blessed life. The second thing we need to understand is this. We bless with words and we bless with our actions. That's, that's, uh, those are the ways that we can be a blessing. We bless with our words. Uh, if you read like in the Old Testament especially, you, you see the blessings uh, that a father would bestow upon his children. You, you see that in the Old Testament. That was a big deal in Old Testament times to, to bestow a verbal blessing to your children. We bless when we're intentional about using words that, that heal and build up instead of words that tear down. We bless with our actions. When our actions are good and pure and kind and helpful, that is a blessing uh, to those around us. I received a, a, a blessing really, well, last night it just all hit me. We, we had a, a family meeting last night. And we don't have family meetings that often, but it's kind of an all-hands-on-deck meeting. And, and I don't want to share the details or anything, but you know, we had a, a, a family meeting uh, about five months ago. And there was a lot of tears at this family meeting. There was a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of unknown. It, it, was, it was a hard meeting as we kind of shared some things and, and talked about uh, our future and, and prayed together. And, um, you know, in many ways, the last uh, five months have been a difficult season uh, for us. And, you know, we're entering into a new season. We've kind of been in a new season with Uncaged Bible Ministry, but entering into a new season of launching a church. And things kind of coming full circle over the last five months, but, and I just wanted to gather the family and, and before we kind of begin to, to launch this new adventure together, to just gather the family together and to talk and to, to kind of, you know, reminisce and, and evaluate and, and, and look to the future as a family and to, to pray together and just, um, and, it, and it really hit me that the things that happened in the last five months and I would say to a degree to us, to not have one of our adult children give up on the church. To still love the church, capital C, the church. That all of our adult kids love Jesus. All of them are actively serving Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Um, one is, is, is preparing for full-time ministry. A couple of them, uh, well, I think all of them are open to full-time ministry and, and, and open to that idea. One of them is serving in a ministry with troubled teens. I, I mean, I, I just was overwhelmed. I mean, you know, life doesn't always turn out how we picture it, does it? You know, how we, we think it's going to be and, the, and this is going to happen. I mean, I mean, where we're at, while it's exciting, this is a really scary season. I'm used to big churches, secure paycheck, <laughs> not starting from scratch and let's see what God does. 
It's scary, to be honest. But God has shown himself faithful week after week, month after month, and God is leading us. And one of the greatest blessings is it's so easy to consume about, oh, you know, all these things and, and you know, and, and just to stop and say, I am blessed. My wife and I are blessed beyond measure because every one of our adult kids are still committed to the local church. As flawed as she may be, as flawed as as its leaders may be, including me, (laughs) they still love Jesus. They still believe in the local church. She is the bride of Christ. Even though she's going to be messy and dirty, she is the bride of Christ. And all that to say this, I just reflected on that yesterday, and I am blessed because my kids' actions have been a blessing to me. You know what it means? It means my wife did something right, raising them. (laughs) And I didn't do that bad a damage. That's that's probably what all that means. And I know the pain that some of you feel. I've been a, a, a pastor for almost 30 years. Man, it makes me feel so old when I say that. I gotta stop saying that. I come up with a new way of saying that. But I have sat in tears with a number of parents over the years, literally weeping, because that's not always the case. There are a lot of young adults that have walked away from the church. And so I I share that, I hope that doesn't make some of you feel bad if that's where where your kids are at, and praise God, it's never too late, amen? Amen. And you cling to the story of the prodigal son, I know. But I'm gonna tell you that them walking holy and fully for Jesus is a blessing. And here, here's my point, is one of the ways you can be a blessing is to show the radical difference Christ can make in your life to those around you. And that'll be a blessing to others. Let your actions be, as Peter said, full of unity and sympathy and brotherly love and tenderness and humility. But not just our actions with our words. And that's what I want to dial in for just a moment. How intentional are we to bless others with our words? How many of us go to work and on the way we pray, Lord, let me be very intentional to be a blessing with my words today. I think it's so much easier, isn't it? It's so much easier to tear down, to criticize, to look at the jars half empty, to give in and just be part of the, you know, work gossip. It's so much easier than to say, no, I'm in elect exile. I am called out to be different. I am to look different. I am to act different. And in acting different, I may take a hit for it, but I will shine the glory of God in doing so. And so how many of us are intentional to be a blessing with our words? How many of us are intentional with our children to affirm the good that we see in them. Not flattery, but the character when we see it on display. When the great painter Benjamin West was a young boy, he decided to draw a picture of his sister, and so he got out the bottles of ink, and he succeeded in making a total mess. But when his mother got home, as only a mother could do, she looked at that mess, and she said to her son, oh my, sweetie, what a beautiful picture, and she kissed him on the head. Years later, this famous painter would say, Those words and that kiss is what made me a painter. I'm going to tell you, there is great power in our words. Proverbs tell us that words have the potential to heal or it can destroy. You know, wars have been started (laughs) from words. And so my challenge for all of us as we think about how to be a blessing 
certainly using our gifts, certainly um, financially. And by the way, many of you have been a blessing to us. Uh, the equipment, the, all of the things that you see have been the, the blessing of people providing financially for us to do that. Those are wonderful ways, but never negate. You really want a blessed life? Then bless others with your actions and with your words. Be intentional to be a person that builds up, raises the climate of the places that you walk into. All right, let's keep going. Number three, let's look at the third thing. Verse 12, and this is really motivation for what I just read, verse 10 and 11. For, or because of, or the, you know, this is why, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So, so he really divides. There's, there's two things. This can go one of two ways for you. <laughs> what you do and what you choose to say, things can go one of two ways. The one way is that his, his eyes will be on you and his ears will be open to your prayers or the face of God can be against you. <laughs> how we bless, the third thing, how we bless or don't bless others determines whether we experience the favor of God or the opposition of God. I don't think I need an illustration. I don't think I need to beg and plead. I don't even think I need to explain this. You can experience the favor of God or you can experience the opposition of God. Have we all like figured out which one we'd prefer? So I could probably move on to the next point, right? Yeah, this is like a modern day miracle. A pastor who spends one minute on a point. Now, listen, I can't really do it in only a minute. Come on. <laughs> There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So let me be careful here. We're not talking about opposition of God, like God rejecting. If you are in Christ, you are secure in that relationship. God is no longer the judge who condemns. He's the father who loves you enough to correct So if we choose not, if we give in to the world and sometimes even in some Christian circles to a self-absorbed form of life and Christianity, but you're a follower of Christ, it doesn't mean you're gonna be condemned in eternal hell. But I will tell you what, I, what, it, what I, I think it does mean. It means that he's not gonna show his favor on you like he, like he could. If you realize it's not about you. That the measure of our life when we stand before God someday is not, oh, look at all you've done for me. We're going to thank and praise God for that. We'll have eternity to do that. But it's going to be, here's what I did. Here's the lives that were impacted. Here's the lives I blessed. Because you so changed, radically changed my life that I just wanted other people to be radically changed. I mean, it touched my heart tonight. One guy came in tonight. He had, had the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, I think a month or so ago, and uh, about a, 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 a month of trying to follow up, and the guy wasn't getting back, and, and the guy finally got back with him, and they're going to meet, and they're going to do follow up. And I just love how the excitement of this individual who got to lead someone to Christ, and now is going to journey with him. This guy didn't say, well, it's going to be a lot of time. We're going to have to meet every week. And this guy didn't know anything about the Bible. I'm going to have to explain stuff left and right. Oh, I'm so busy. No, this is a person that's been changed in his own life by Christ. That when, when he has an opportunity to see someone else's life change, to come a lot and walk beside him is nothing but pure joy. Because when you've been blessed, you want to bless. That's how that works. And when we get that, when we see that Christianity isn't about us, the crowns we get, are uh, we're going to just lay at his feet anyways <laughs> in humble adoration. When we get that, God will continue to pour his favor and specifically, he'll keep his eye on us and he'll be attentive to the prayers. 
You want to see God do amazing things in your prayer life. It's not learn fancy prayer. It's not even learning the mechanics of prayer in, in, in many ways. Prayer is pretty simple in my book. It's your heart communing with God. It's you just talking to God as your loving father. And the more you give of yourself to be a blessing to others, the more he's going to be attentive to the prayers that you offer up to him. Boy, there goes my one minute for the point. Man, I, I tried. I didn't try hard, but I tried. I don't know about you, but it's just pretty simple, right? I want the favor of God, not the opposition of God. Amen? You still with me? We good? Okay. One more. You got one more in you? Can you do one more? I don't have a clock. I don't have a watch. I have no idea how long I'm going, so who knows? One more point. You got one more in you? Is that it? I'm going to add one more just for that, I think. I'm just going to make up a point. Not even in the Bible. I'm going to make it up. No, I'm kidding. All right, here we go. What are we on? Verse 13 through 17. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? In other words, in most situations, if you do what's good, you're not, it's, you're, harm's not going to come to you, right? If you're zealous for doing what's good, harm, but that's not always the case as followers of Christ. And he gives an example, verse 14 through 17. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, which they were, you will be blessed. You don't see many books on that. How to experience the blessed life. Find persecution in your life. <laughs> right? If you suffer for righteous sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Who's them? The ones persecuting you. But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. Holy means to be set apart, consecrated. He, 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 <laughs> you'll take whatever the world throws at you because you have set him apart as your only God that you're going to follow. No matter what the world throws at you for not bowing a knee to their gods. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. You don't put them to shame, your conduct does. This is where I think we have to be careful on social media as just one example. To not shame opposing views, like intentionally trying to mock or our lives is what shames ungodliness. Our character is what speaks. Verse 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. While I, one of the reasons I don't promote a health and wealth gospel is because sometimes it is God's will that we suffer for doing good. If we're consumed with the glory of God, then whatever brings that, we should say, when we understand life is mom, mo, uh, momentary, if suffering brings you glory, then Lord, help me suffer well. If we think Christians shouldn't suffer and then you do, now all of a sudden you're suffering and now you also feel shame because you feel like you shouldn't be suffering if you were a good Christian. That is not true. Again, I look at the life of Christ <laughs> and we are to be like Christ. Sometimes suffering is part of the will of God for some greater glory that God receives that we won't even probably realize till heaven what it was. 
So here's the fourth and last <laughs> point. Even the beatings of the world are a blessing from God when we're living right before him. When we're living right before God and we suffer for that, that is a blessing. You may say, well, it doesn't feel like a blessing. <laughs> yeah, not always. Here's one of the reasons why I think it's such a blessing. Because when you suffer for doing right, you have just entered into a selective company of followers who are persecuted for the faith. In fact, I think Jesus even said in the Beatitudes, like the prophets, you are blessed if you are persecuted. Beatings are even a blessing when we suffer for choosing to do what's right. And I am, it's just of my opinion, and, and I am optimistic person by nature, um, but I, I do believe that the, the trend of where the world is, is, is heading is that our society is becoming more and more of a Christ-less society. Which means the more and more we commit ourselves to be Christ-like, as our society becomes more and more Christ-less, there is going to be a tension there. There's going to be a battle <laughs> there, a spiritual battle that may play out in the political realm. It can play out in all kinds of different realms. And I wonder this. Are we... tough enough <laughs> or have we listened to the oh gee everything should go wonderful for me because I follow Jesus or are we ready to endure the persecution that I think will probably continue to come more and more so into our lives until the return of Christ I'm not a prophet I don't no, I'm just saying the trends and even, I mean, I'm sorry. I just, I just look at some of the things out there and the things being said and, the, and like, I'm like, <laughs> it's evil, some of the stuff. That's not even being said in secret places, but like openly. Like this is, this is wrong. <laughs> this is so contrary. It's not just God's word, but just being in the image of God. Like, well, like I'm telling you, I'm not necessarily give you like exact, ex you know, specific examples, but I think you know what I'm talking about. You just we were hearing stuff, and we're watching things, and and we're hearing viewpoints and philosophies, and I'm just just like, this is so contrary. And we are moving more and more in that direction, and so we have to decide. Will we, in gentleness and respect, as Peter said, with love, choose to stand up and be willing to face persecution for choosing to act like Christ, to speak like Christ? Are we willing to be persecuted for that and not by ridiculing back or getting in the gutter with them, but by a life that looks like Jesus? Shame the world to their knees. Not shame for the sake of shame, but shame them with our lives to their knees till they realize, my goodness, I need a savior. I'm going to just throw this out there because I, I don't want to leave this on the table. I'm just going to give it to you real quick. And I'm going to ask you if you could write these things down. Because I do mean that. I, I do think more and more persecution is going to come to the Christ follower around the world. I mean, by the way, it's already around the world in many places, but I think it's coming more and more here too as well. 
Um, so let me just give this to you that you can on a rainy day pull out and, and look at. But these are all from First Peter. I'll just give them to you. Principles for being persecuted for our faith. Number one, don't let them see you sweat. Peter says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. You do not have to be intimidated by the world or the philosophies of this world. You do not have to back down when it is counter what scripture says. You can stand up in love and take a stand and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without fear. Because greater, oh, I felt like there should have been an amen there. Amen. Okay, too late, doesn't count. I had, to, I had to beg, so it doesn't count. All right, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So don't be afraid to stand up. I said, that's not right. Just do it in the right way. Number two, be ready for it by keeping Christ first in your own life. Right? Peter says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. We are not going to be able to fight the spiritual battle if we're weak, lazy, flabby soldiers. Don't have time for God's word. We're, you know, we're, we're pandering after the things of the world. world. There are just things we're doing, other Christians aren't watching, but we're doing them and we're, you know, we're, 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 we're turning to lesser gods in, in some of the ways. They still follow Christ, but I, I, holding on to these things. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, if we're going to endure and be able to stand for Christ, and even die for Christ, if that day comes, and we sure need to make sure that we are setting apart in our daily life, setting Christ as Lord in first place so that the things of this world are tempting us to cower. Number three, know how to f defend your faith appropriately. Peter says, always being prepared to make a defense, yet do it with gentleness and respect. I think an easy mistake, and I have been guilty of that, so I'll just point the finger at myself. I, I think what we've done um, is I, I think that we have raised a generation. We've told them what to believe, but we haven't taught them why to believe it. I think that we've, we've I think the American church, we, we got enamored with this whole growth, church growth movement of the 80s and 90s and it's still in effect today where we want to draw big crowds and we want to bring people in and so we give shorter talks. No worries there with me. <laughs> we give shorter talks. We try to throw in some, you know, secular music and all these things from culture and then we, we do all these things. We try to make it as entertaining as possible and, and, and then we kind of, like whether we say it or not, it's like the goal is, did they really love it? <laughs> you know, and in my opinion, what we are creating are, are very inch deep followers of Christ who do not know the word of God and they do not know how to defend the word of God. And, you know, whenever someone starts a church, they're, oh, we're going to do it different. Like that's, you know, every church plant says that, right? But one of the reasons I am excited uh, going into this unknown of starting a church is from day one, um, God's word is gonna be preeminent. It's gonna be Christ-centered and God's word is gonna be preeminent. People are going to get meat, not milk, on a Sunday morning. Unapologetically and, and, and training and not just, you know, not even just going through books of the Bible, but, but a strategic plan of training where people in the course of being in this church are going to learn doctrine. They're going to learn apologetics. Why? Because we're flabby. We're flabby soldiers. And I don't mean to be insulting. We just are. I've been at this for 30 years. I've been part of the problem. I, I drank the Kool-Aid for a number of years. I was in some of the largest churches in Michigan. I thought that was success. I preached in church of 15,000, 10,000, 7,000. I thought that's what made me a, a great pastor. We drew a crowd, but did we make disciples? That will be able to stand up and engage in spiritual battle. 
who not only know what the word says, but know how to defend the tenets of the faith that for generations men and women have died for. Just don't go over. I just got to get to lunch by 12. We got to beat the Baptist there. <laughs> My apologies to Baptists. I guess it really wasn't an insult to Baptists. But. Let's hunger for the word of God. Let's feast on the word of God. But let's also learn how to defend. If you're like, well, how, I don't know how to defend it. Well, just get a hold of me at, at Tony at UncagedBibleMinister.com. I'll send you research. I'll meet with you. We'll talk how to defend the faith, to be prepared to give an answer for the reason that we have. Number four, don't give the enemy ammo for the way you're living. Those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. No, none of us are perfect. All of us have hypocrisy in us. <laughs> I promise you that I will not perfectly live out the word of God until we meet again next, next Monday. But is there a consistency of character? When I'm in a store and none of the church people are around and, 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 and I'm there and with people that don't know Jesus and they look at me, how do I behave? How do I act? Is it, is it a show on Sunday or is what you see on Sunday what people get during the week and the, the, the mean people and the cranky people and the annoying people and the people who get your order wrong and all of those things, how do I treat them? Now, how do I treat you when you walk through the doors? How do I treat them? It's those kind of things. It's our day-to-day -day character, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's our day-to-day -day character that if we are being transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we are feasting on the word day in and day out and we are sitting at the feet of the Savior and we're worshiping him, then we have lives that are a blessing to others and not just a blessing to other Christians. It is a blessing the way that we talk and the way that we act is a blessing to those that are far from God and it could be that they laugh behind our back but they watch and they watch and they watch and they watch and eventually they watch long enough and they fall to their knees in shame for their sin and they repent and find the love of Jesus Christ. And that, friends, is what it means to be a blessing. It's so ironic that this context of Peter talking about what is the blessed life, it's <laughs> the context, it's a life of suffering for Christ. I'll close with this. John Bunyan, I'm sure most of you, maybe all of you have heard of John Bunyan, the Puritan from the 1600s. Of course, he wrote the famous Christian allegory, Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, Bunyan actually grew up poor and educated. Uh, he wasn't uh, educated like the, many of the writers of England of that day. Um, but God blessed him with the gift of imagination and the ability to take that imagination and put it on paper. As an adult, he ended up giving his life to Christ. He grew up in a religious home, but not a home um, where Christ was really, um, where the gospel was really proclaimed. And as an adult, John Bunyan became a follower of Christ, and he became a lay minister. And at that time, the, the, um, the king of England, I can't remember who it was now, I want to say King Philip, but I don't know if that's correct, um, the king at the time um, required all to be part of the Church of England, but the Church of England was uh, religiosity. It wasn't <laughs> proclaiming a relationship with Christ. It wasn't rooted in the gospel. John Bunyan refused to stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and John Bunyan was thrown into prison for 12 years. But instead of whining and pouting, he saw this as a blessing of God, and he used those 12 years to write numerous books that have impacted lives for hundreds and hundreds of years, one of them, the most famous of those being the Pilgrim's Progress. And this is what he said about the persecution that he endured for his commitment to Christ. 
Therefore, I bind these lies and slanderous accusations to my person as an ornament. It belongs to my Christian profession to be vilified, slandered, reproached, and reviled. And since all this is nothing but that, as God and my conscience testify, I rejoice in being reproached for Christ's sake. Boy, I want that depth of a faith, don't you? I wear it like an ornament. What an honor. Father God, thank you for the words tonight. We all want a blessed life, Father. I ask that you bless this ministry. I I ask that you bless those that listen tonight, Father, and bless us in whatever way that you choose to do bless us, Father. But, But may we see the ultimate blessing is being a life where you show your favor because you are pleased with the way that we are living, the way that we are talking, the way that we are interacting with others, that the blessing, the joy... The loving life, as it says, and experiencing good days is found not in what we have. It's found in having a healthy, growing, vibrant walk with you. That's the blessing. And out of that, Father, may we bless those around us and those in need of the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Amen.